together with the French president, try in the so-called Normandy format to bring about a diplomatic solution. The foreign ministers of this uh, Normandy format met uh, yesterday. Um, there are certain small um, uh, steps to, uh, towards uh, progress, uh, although there are many setbacks as well. The Minsk agreement, at any rate, is the basis on which these negotiations take place and we try to find a solution. Ladies and gentlemen, apart from these global challenges, there are also challenges of an economic nature um, and challenges to our societies as a whole. This year, Germany is in the chair of the G7, and those issues that we consider to be of uh, prime importance for the long-term and sustainable development of our world is something that we wish to work on, protection of the climate, reduction of poverty, fight against antimicrobial uh, resistance, and also uh, I take this issue particularly to heart, empowerment of women to set up their own business. What is also important is to make them more stronger, economically speaking. Europe continues to be confronted by great challenges. We quite often talked about the um, sovereign debt crisis, about the crisis in the euro area. We have this somewhat under control now, but we are not out of the woods yet. We have not overcome it, and Europe, more essentially, hasn't really regained sufficient trust, hasn't regained sufficient competitiveness. I am always for not painting matters in black and white. Quite often, so-called austerity is pitted against the so-called growth model. Um, I think that this is totally wrong. We need a growth-oriented sound fiscal policy, we need investments, we need investments by the state, but we first and foremost need an environment uh, which um, encourages private investors to take out investments. And if today, um, in these very minutes, um, we expect a uh, decision by the European Central Bank, then this will be a decision that will be taken uh, totally independent. Um, let me state this very clearly. We in Germany, as you know, have this long tradition of time and again stressing that the ECB is um, independent and should be independent, but as a politician, no matter what, I would say, no matter what sort of decision the ECB will take. We should not become diverted by from the fact that we need to put as politicians the necessary framework conditions in place for recovery. And we have progress in quite a number of countries, particularly the so-called program countries. We have very clear reform um, efforts, um, for example, also in Italy. I say finally, the, um, you've had the Italian Prime Minister here addressing you. These are very important signs. In France, there is a new course and that is clearly uh, growth-oriented, which is a very good um, uh, message and, a very, and very good news, but time is of the essence because every day these adjustment mechanisms um, are not done and that we sort of wait uh, with improve for um, until we improve our competitiveness is a lost day. We need jobs and these jobs have to be created in those areas which um, promise long-term highly qualified employment. So digitization and the, how we react in Europe to digitization and this phenomenon it will be essential. Germany is uh, very pleased that um, it is our commissioner, um, the German commissioner who is responsible for this particular industry. Um, and it is, I think, a very good sign that the European Commission has not only launched an investment program, um, but is also looking at the political framework conditions. But a sober a look at um, the digital agenda and of Europe and the role of the United States and also of a number of Asian countries very clearly shows that we lag behind. Um, we have to try to close that gap. We're not leading um, the development here. So we need to put the political framework condition in place, as I said. We need to find the right mix, the right balance of in protection of the data of the individual, but also freedom to use those data to um, develop new products. And as German Federal Chancellor, I want our strong German economy um, to be able to um, actually um, cope with this merger of the so-called real economy and the digital um, economy to what is uh, commonly called Industry 4.0. And uh, because otherwise, we will lose out competition. 
in the competition. And we, um, I think, enter into this competition with self-confidence, but uh, we haven't yet uh, won that. Um, I think we have in Europe, with this uh, huge single market that we have, very good opportunities, but Europe become, must become more rapid, must become, must become faster, must become more uh, competitive and less regulated. I am very pleased that this Commission has set itself the goal uh, to, to do that. For the first time, we have this um, um, trilogue between um, the European Commission, the European Parliament, and the European Council. And I think if we work on this basis um, of this new agenda that we have given ourselves, we have a very good opportunity, a very good chance of getting stronger out of this crisis, out of this European crisis than we went in. And the, the examples of um, Spain, of Portugal, of Ireland, and also in parts of Greece show that um, actually reforms are well worth your while. They are efficient and growth can return. What does Germany do? In this competition, Germany wants to play a responsible role. I think we've shown that um, growth-oriented, sound fiscal uh, consolidation is possible in 2014 for the first time uh, for 40 years. We have not um, any new net borrowing in our um, budget. And I know that some people accuse us of being uh, too uh, tight with our money, as it were, um, as regards our budgetary policy. But let me remind you that Germany has a massive demographic challenge, as probably no other European country has. More than six million people will be lost to our market um, who are now gainfully employed because they retire. And if we're not solid in the way that we do our business and try to keep our debts down, then we will leave a very heavy burden to the next generation. They will simply not have the necessary breathing space, and I think that this would be irresponsible. Well, one of the few member countries of the European Union that spends 3% uh, of its uh, GDP on research and development, I think, um, were attractive to others because of that um, for research and development. Private consumption has um, increased. Um, it is actually carrying um, and boosting economic growth. The um, growth has been 1.5 percent, which may be compared to the U.S., is somewhat modest, but for us it is quite respectable. We want to continue uh, this course. We also want to continue uh, this course of increasing employment. We have as many people in jobs, um, gainfully in gainful employment, um, as we've ever had um, during our history. Um, and um, those are very, very good figures that we have in this um, area, um, particularly uh, 43 million people in gainful employment of 80 million inhabitants, and um, we want to remain a stable um, anchor uh, in Europe. Ladies and gentlemen, we all know we cannot shut ourselves off against the rest of the world, and we shouldn't do this. So let me plead for the European Union being an open-minded uh, place for ag agreeing on free trade investments. Um, the CETA, for example, the uh, free trade agreement with Canada is almost there. It needs to be finalized. Um, TTIP is currently under negotiation. The um, American president has committed himself uh, to these negotiations, and I think that is a unique chance for Europe, that it should seize Opportunities for growth can in this way be speeded up uh, through less obstacles in transatlantic trade. But what's also important is we have very high standards in consumer protection um, and generally around in industrial production as well. So we could do something in order to be standard setters globally. And we can only do that if we do that together with the United States, and which this is why I will come out um, very strongly in favor of this. And we'll work for it um, tirelessly. Ladies and gentlemen, we're challenged, not only economically speaking, but also as regards um, standing up for our values. The digital world creates a situation where there are no secrets anymore, no <clears throat> uncharted waters, as it were. The civil societies want to know what's happening. They want to know um, how the world is governed. Uh, they want transparency. And we are looking forward to this kind of challenge. We don't want to always talk about the risks, as so many people do. We want to see the opportunities. We want to be a good partner in Europe and in the world. Thank you very much. A warm thank you, Madam Chancellor. 
Perhaps I may come back very briefly to the key parts of your presentation, your speech. You spoke about the conflicts, conflict situations that are prevailing. And if I could just touch upon the Ukraine, I'd say that the first objective must be to implement the Minsk agreement or protocol. But what do you think is the long-term outlook? You are in contact permanently, so with the main actors in this conflict. What is the way out of this conflict? Because the longer it lasts, the more it will cost for everyone involved. What is the way out of this conflict? Well, in order to solve a conflict, you always need to. And uh, let me assure you that we shall not relent in our efforts uh, to bring this conflict to a solution. Our objective is to uphold the territorial integrity of Ukraine. It needs to be restored short-term, first in the Lugansk and Donetsk um, area, but Crimea obviously is not forgotten, but Lugansk and Donetsk are uh, very urgent, very pressing. Our demand is, and that is something